In this video, you'll learn to draw the products of reactions, given the starting materials and electron pushing arrows. In the first section, you'll draw the products of an intermolecular reaction. Intermolecular reactions take place between molecules, while intramolecular reactions take place within a single molecule. Here is a recommended strategy when you need to draw the products of a reaction, as well as key principles to keep in mind. We'll apply this strategy to the example on screen, a reaction between an enolate and an alkyl bromide. First, we expand this structure by drawing all the bonds, atoms, and electrons, especially the parts involved in the reaction. Next, we're going to do what's called mapping, which means to carefully identify the atoms and electrons in the reaction and tracking them into the product. Mapping can be done by highlighting each atom, using different colors for each reactant, numbering the atoms, or a combination of these techniques. This numbering is not for nomenclature, so when mapping, you can use whatever system works best for you. What does each arrow indicate? Take a minute to select the most appropriate answer for each arrow. The leftmost red arrow indicates non-bonding electrons on oxygen forming an oxygen-carbon bond. The carbon-carbon pi electrons will form a new bond between carbons 3 and 6. The third arrow indicates the carbon 6-bromine 7 bond is breaking with the bonding electrons going on to the bromine atom. For some people, it helps to build a molecular model of the reaction. I will show an example of this a bit later with an intramolecular reaction. Now it's time to draw the product. First, redraw everything that has not changed between the two molecules. Then start to add in the new bonds, for example, between the oxygen and C2. There's a new C3, C6 bond. And the bromine has broken away from C6 and has taken the electrons from that bond. What is the charge on the bromine atom, if any? Bromine has a minus one formal charge. Now that we've drawn the product, we have to review our work to make sure we have done so correctly. First, check the mapping to make sure that all the atoms are present and that they are all connected correctly. We've made the new oxygen carbon pi bond. The C2, C3 pi bond is gone. We have a new C3, C6 bond. Carbon six is still bonded to carbon five and carbon-5 is still bonded to the methyl groups 4 and 8. Those methyl groups have not changed because they were not involved in the reaction. And make sure that we still have bromine atom number 7. Mapping tells us that all atoms and electrons have been conserved. Next, make sure that all formal charges have been included correctly. There should be the same overall charge in the reactants as in the products. There was an overall minus one charge in the starting materials, so there will be an overall minus one charge in the products. After doing all this work, we have arrived at the final products, and we can be confident that our answer is correct. But wait, we're not quite done. Remember when that C2, C3 bond broke? Why didn't the new bond form between C2 and C6 instead of C3 and C6? When there is more than one possible answer, and this will happen fairly frequently, draw out all the possibilities and analyze them. Let's draw the product that would form if C2 and C6 bonded. We still have the oxygen carbon pi bond. The carbon 2 carbon 6 bond is now present, and the bromine still has taken the electrons from the carbon 6 bromine 7 bond. There is a problem with this structure. Can you identify it? There are three formal charges in this structure, 
with an overall charge of minus 1 like before, because the two opposite charges cancel out. Having more charges tends to be less favorable energetically, but it's still possible. Carbon can also lack an octet, which gives it a positive charge. There's a bigger problem. The major issue here is that carbon-2 is pentavalent, meaning it has five bonds to it, or ten electrons. This is not physically possible, because carbon does not have enough room in its orbitals for all those electrons. The maximum number is eight. That means that the second mechanism we're analyzing is not a plausible one. The first one that we drew is much more reasonable. In this section, you learn to draw the product of an intermolecular reaction, giving the starting materials and electron pushing arrows. We did this by using specific strategies, including expanding the structure, mapping, drawing the products, and checking our work. We kept in mind some key principles as we did this, knowing that electron pushing arrows always start at electrons and point to an atom or bond. Atoms, electrons, and charges are conserved between starting materials and products. There needs to be the same number on both sides. Because electrons stay with one of the originating atoms, we had to figure out which carbon the pi bond stayed with, either carbon-2 or carbon-3. We found that only one of those options made sense physically, the bond with carbon-3. Next, you'll learn to draw the product of an intramolecular reaction, given the starting material and electron pushing arrows. Intermolecular reactions take place between molecules, while intramolecular reactions take place within a single molecule. The strategy for drawing the product of intramolecular reactions is the same as for any other. The key principles are the same, too. The example we'll use is a step in the synthesis of Havelicate. This compound was isolated from a soft coral and is being studied for potential medicinal properties that are discovered in many marine organisms. Marine organisms biosynthesize many molecules used for defense, competition, and reproduction. Professor Berrio's group at the University of Ottawa developed the synthesis of Havelicate's framework. Our goal is to draw the product of one of the key steps. We'll start by simplifying this very complex structure. Notice that the complex left-hand portion of the molecule is not involved in this reaction. There are no arrows going to or from it. We'll use the blue R group to represent the left-hand portion of the molecule not involved. Chemists commonly use the letter R to represent different parts of a molecule, which simplifies the structure and lets us focus just on the reacting portion. We expand the structure to make sure we keep track of all the atoms. Next, we begin the first stage of mapping by numbering the atoms. Describe the bonds that have broken and formed. What does the top electron pushing arrow represent? The top arrow explains that the C5, C6 pi bond breaks as it makes a new C6, C1 bond. The leftmost arrow shows the C1, C2 pi electrons becoming a C2, C3 pi bond, and the C3, O4 bond breaks, making a new O4, C5 pi bond. We can build a model to help understand the reaction. The carbon atoms are black, the oxygen atom is red, and the R group is blue. For C1 and C6 to form a bond, they have to be close to each other. The reaction will occur once the molecule has rotated into the appropriate reactive conformation. I'll redraw the molecule in the conformation shown in the model. Notice that it looks like a six-membered ring. We follow the mechanism using the model. The pi electrons between carbons 1 and 2 become the pi electrons between carbons 2 and 3. The bond between C3 and O4 breaks and becomes a pi bond between O4 and C5. The pi electrons between C5 and C6 become a new sigma bond between C6 and C1. Now we can draw the product.
We check our work by making sure all the atoms are still present in the product, that we have drawn the new bonds correctly, and that the charges are balanced. In this case, all the atoms are neutral. Now what about tricky situations when there is lots of stereochemistry to consider? Here is an example of a polyether antibiotic isolated from a soil bacterium. It's a complicated structure, so what do we do to approach this question? As before, we simplify where we can. Represent portions that are not involved as R groups. We can also approach this problem in a stepwise fashion by ignoring stereochemistry initially, then adding it in later if necessary. To ignore the stereochemistry, I've redrawn the molecule flat. Expanding the structure is always a good idea at this stage, although the amount you do will depend on your comfort level and the difficulty of the problem. We number the atoms as the first stage in the mapping process. Now we can describe the outcome of each electron pushing arrow and use that description to draw the product. Try this on your own before looking at the answer. The arrows describe forming a new oxygen-1 to carbon-5 bond, and that the bond between carbon-5 and the positively charged oxygen breaks. We can use this information to draw the product. We check our work by completing the mapping process. You can number the atoms in the product and make sure they match up with the atoms from the starting materials. Double check that all formal charges have been correctly assigned and that the overall charge has been conserved between starting materials and products. You can highlight electrons with different colors to make sure you've made and broken the bonds correctly. Finally, we add back in the actual structures of the R groups and the stereochemistry. At the very least, we can be sure that the configurations have not changed for atoms not involved in the reaction. During your courses, you will learn how to predict the configuration of the atoms that reacted. The stereochemical outcome depends on the reaction type and goes beyond the scope of this module. In this section, you learn to draw the product of an intramolecular reaction, given the starting material and electron pushing arrows. Next, you'll learn to draw the product of a reaction that involves a sigma bond migration. In this section, you'll learn to draw the products of a reaction that involves sigma bond migration, given the starting materials and electron pushing arrows. The key principle to keep in mind is that the electrons from the migrating bond stay with one of the original atoms. For example, in the reaction of sodium hydroxide with hydrochloric acid, the non-bonding electrons from the oxygen atom remain with the oxygen and become shared with the hydrogen atom. The electrons from the HCl bond remain with one of the atoms from that bond, the chlorine. This principle holds true for any type of reaction, no matter how complicated. The example on screen was published in the Journal of Organic Chemistry in 1950, Volume 15, starting page 1191. You can look it up if you'd like more information. The reaction involves a number of mechanistic steps. We will focus on the third step because it involves a sigma bond migration. The electrons from the carbon-carbon bond stay with one of the carbon atoms. We have to figure out which one, carbon 1 or 2. What do you think? The electrons leave carbon-1 and stay with carbon-2. We can figure this out by analyzing the two possibilities. If the electrons stayed with carbon-1, that carbon atom would become pentavalent. Because this is not possible, this cannot be right. If the electrons stayed with carbon-2 and broke away from carbon-1, a six-membered ring would form. This obeys all chemical rules, and you can check that this is possible using a molecular model. We can redraw the structure more cleanly, then go back to the main mechanism. After one more step, 
and acid-base reaction, we arrive at the final product. In summary, any time there's a sigma bond migration or any other tricky kind of mechanistic step, analyze the various possibilities, keeping the key principles in mind. These key principles apply to any reaction mechanism, whether it's an intermolecular reaction step, an intramolecular reaction step, or a bond migration.